All right, well, we'll wait for that to, as that's coming up, we'll kind of get started here. Um, so for those of you that don't know, I guess, who I am, um, I'm Mitchell Sellers. I run a consulting company um, based out of the United States, do um, a lot of DNN work, et cetera. Uh, the more recent development, it came up, it came up. hey, it came up, all right, look at that. All right, so all my contact information is going to be up here as well. Um, for those of you, um, if you have any questions, et cetera, um, things that we can't get to in today's session, um, please do reach out to me. Um, in addition to you know, the other stuff that I do, I am the lead of the technology advisory group I'm working on establishing all of the processes and procedures for community contributions into DNN, um, you know, changing the way that we're doing that kind of stuff, working on getting the future direction of where we go with DNN. Um, and one of the most important things with that is what we're here to talk about today, which is .NET Core and DNN in terms of you know, what things look like, where we're going, what we're seeing, um, what things might look like in the future. I'm not saying anything here, um, you know, it, it's, it's not an absolute yet. Um, we're still working on exactly where things need to go and this is where the rest of the community kind of sharing what you guys have seen. So with this, I've got slides today, um, but the real big thing is, is if you've got questions, if you've ran across something, have concerns, you know, get my attention. Let's make sure that we get uh, as much of that answered. Um, and then after the session, you know, as well, please get with me. Um, really interested in seeing everyone's thoughts and direction as we move forward and look to get things, um, you know, continuing to move to the modern pathway. So. Just to keep myself on track a little bit here, I've got an agenda broken down a little bit into you know, why we're talking about .NET Core, why it's important, what that really means for us as developers, um, for those of you that are you know, maybe not developers but just implementing, you know, what might that mean for you. Um, then we'll talk a little bit about why it's not simple um, and why it's not necessarily something that we can just flip a switch and, and make happen. And then we'll talk a little bit about the direction of DNN. What, what has DNN done? What technology migrations have we already seen as a platform? And what might we have to look forward and how does this play into how we've done things in the past versus how we might do things with core? Um, and then I'll talk a little bit about architecture options in terms of what can you do today to make yourself better prepared for whatever transition we may have in the future. And I'll show one quick example of, of what we've done architecturally um, with a couple of our, our projects. So .NET Core, how many of you are aware of what .NET Core is? Okay, so most of you are familiar, right? The basic summary, right, is .NET Core is the latest and greatest technology from Microsoft. It is cross-platform. It allows you to work with a much smaller footprint. It changes the deployment paradigm. Right? It really changes the way that we do development as .NET developers. From Microsoft's perspective, right, it's the newest thing, um, but it's not just the newest thing. It's the thing that Microsoft is investing in. Okay? Um, from our perspective, from a DNN perspective, we had to manage developer expectations. Now the .NET Core just isn't that, hey, this is a cool new Microsoft thing that may take off. It's the new, here's everything with Microsoft, right? I don't know how much you pay attention in the more broad spectrum of .NET releases, but Microsoft has recently announced that .NET Core is going to be supporting Windows Forms and Xamarin in version 3. Okay. What does that really mean for us? What it means is we cannot ignore it, period. The second that they brought WinForms and the uh, Windows apps, the universal apps, the UWA apps, once it did that, we now have the whole suite. We have Windows, we have console, we have web, all cross-platform, all agnostic to that environment. That tells you right there, right, this is where Microsoft's going to put the money. We're still going to get maintenance. We're still going to get enhancements, right? Each release of the .NET framework, you know, 461, 462, 47, 471, all of those have had incremental improvements. But what we're looking at is we're looking at 
a little bit of lifeblood, right? A little bit of band-aiding here, maybe a, a little bit of makeup on that, that jagged edge. But we're not seeing the big investments. And what we're seeing is we get a freedom of development by doing this, by being able to build an ASP.NET app and .NET Core that can run on Linux or Windows gives environment flexibility. It gives deployment flexibility, right? We can go into cheaper hosting options. We can go into hosting options that's maybe more favorable for an IT team that an organization may have, right? They may have .NET developers, but Linux admins. You know, historically, right, that's oil and water. We don't ever get along. Um, but we can change that with this. And from our perspective, we care about it. Since we now are pretty darn sure this is the future, we've got to figure out how we migrate towards it, right? We want to be able to future-proof ourselves because we don't want to be stuck, right? We all know the folks that said classic ASP is dead, which it should be, but the reality is there's still thousands and thousands of sites running on classic ASP. We don't want our platform to be the classic ASP of the .NET world, right? We want to make sure that we have a pathway forward. Um, and what we also get, okay, sure, that's all fine and dandy, right? We want to be relevant. But there's better things that we get from a development methodology perspective. We get performance gains. We get dependency injection, other things that are really complicated for us to do right now. You know, oftentimes we're used with third-party libraries, et cetera. All of these things are built in with .NET Core. Okay? We've done a lot of benchmarking on various projects, whether they're .NET Nuke or otherwise. Um, we took old MVC projects, migrated them to Core as much as we could line for line, you know, section by section without making any functional changes. Overall performance throughput changes were over 60% more favorable on .NET Core with the same application, same database queries, same data structures, same website sizes, right? So that would be good, right? Anything we can do to improve the performance of DNN would be phenomenal, right? We, we all have struggled with that at some point um, along the way. So I just mentioned, right, that I've done it with MVC apps and it, it's simple. Well, in the DNN space, it's not quite as simple. What we, what we have right now in DNN is a mixed technology stack. We are primarily ASP.NET Web Forms. How many of you are doing custom module development and you're using the MVC model? Okay, how many of you are doing custom development and using the Web Forms model? Okay, so the biggest thing here is we see that we have a web forms model and we have an MVC model. The problem is our MVC model isn't even really full MVC, right? It's MVC inside of DNN's pipeline, where we're actually kind of swapping behind the scenes a little bit of trickery, where a web forms pipeline still exists. We're just saying, oh, wait, wait, for this piece, do it the MVC way, right? We're kind of switching some things out. So what that ends up getting with us is kind of some fun things, right? And what that means is we don't have a, a, a migrated uh, pathway. We also have to keep in mind that to move forward, we also have to think about, well, what do we do with all of the existing dependencies that we've essentially enforced upon ourselves, right? So... DAL2 introduced Petapoco. So you now have custom modules, right, that may be using Petapoco and that data integration. How do we migrate that forward? We have stored procedures in use in a lot of places. There's a lot of desire, right, to move towards an entity framework model. Well, how do we migrate one way but not break those modules that were there before, right? Because the goal is to be able to drag everything forward, at least as much as we can, right? The biggest reason why it's not as simple is system.web.dll, where we have web forms implemented. 
does not exist in ASP.NET Core. The Web Forms programming paradigm, the process in which Web Forms works, does not exist in .NET Core. Now, we had a shred of potential great news out of Microsoft in February. There was rumor, there was talk that we might have been able to get some bridge work done, right, to make it easier. Um, unfortunately, that's not going to be feasible right now. So what that means is, is we have to find a way to take what we have today and completely unravel it. For those of you that have been doing module development and worked with the different models, you know that we haven't even fully done that as a platform. If you build an MVC module today, you have no working solution to use a rich text editor in an MVC module that has DNN integration, for example. And we still have a couple of those other areas. So we have some cleanup to do at a framework level before we can actually start to migrate. So what, what has DNN done in the past? What, what's the direction been you know, what are we trying to do? You know, recently, we formed the Technology Advisory Group. Okay, this Technology Advisory Group, any of you can join this advisory group as well. We have been meeting on a weekly basis um, for the last couple of months. Our goal is to continue to identify a plan of how we move forward. Right? The end goal of this group is to solve the .NET Core problem. Okay. We are currently in that group solving a couple other problems first. Community pull request management, the interaction between the community and ESW, those are things that this group is working to get addressed right now. We want to get pull requests flowing more fluidly. We want to have a set of standards in place that apply to the community, that apply to ESW contributions. We're still working on some of that stuff. In fact, I'm going to be chatting with Andy about all of this a little bit more later this week. We actually pared it kind of down to 21 items that we needed to get some direction on and come to mutual understanding. Um, and I think we're getting closer and closer to understanding the, the real crux there. So there's some stuff moving on there right now that's propelling us forward. But historically, we um, have to kind of understand we're at a place where the writing's on the wall, right? We've got to do it. Right? Andy mentioned in his keynote this morning right, that we want to be relevant. We want to you know, be that, that uh, community that can engage people. And to be there, right, we do need to be with .NET Core. So no matter what we want to do, no matter if any of you really care about cross-platform, we need to care as a community to push ourselves there. We've seen these kinds of transitions in the past. Depending on how long you've been around in the community, we had the transition from VB to C Sharp. Um, we know that some of you had very strong opinions <laughs> in both directions of what that change meant, but we went through that change. We managed to make that change as a community without really breaking anything. Okay? But it took some time to figure out a pathway to make that happen. We've had the Web Forms MVC transition. It's not a full transition. But we found a way to integrate and allow you to follow an MVC paradigm. Right? The goal there was to broaden the developer base, and we've managed to, to kind of get there at least a little bit. The control bar moving to a React-based persona bar. Right? All of these are transitions where the community has been at some technological deficiency, if you will, and we've been working on migrating it forward. Right? Now, the key is the communication for some of these items has not been as great as we want. Right? The persona bar. A lot of people are like, oh gosh, how do we do this now? We don't have solid documentation. And this is why what we want to do is we want to energize around the pathway here. How can we do this? And what can we do to allow you as a developer to be ready rather than six months from now, or a year from now, or 18 months from now. I don't want to put a timeline to it. But whenever we release a .NET Core capable version of DNN, I want everybody in this room to know exactly how to run their code in that environment before it's released. 
which means we've got to talk about what you're doing, what paradigms you're using. How are you doing web forms development? Because if you're doing all of your web forms development with everything in the code behind, and it's one giant code file, we're going to have a really hard time helping you move forward, right? But if we can change some of the things that you're doing today as a developer, we can lessen that burden. And that's what I want to kind of focus on a little bit. One of the things that will be coming in most likely the 9.3 release is also a new bit of support for Razor pages. Now, how many of you have looked at what Razor pages are? Okay. So the thought process behind Razor Pages is they're closer in functionality to that of a Web Forms module. So by being able to support Razor Pages, which is something that Microsoft supports in the MVC model as a first class citizen, it's a .NET Core concept, it's recently added, so it's something that's going to stay there. Our thought process by including support for Razor Pages is for those of us with all of these old, old Web Forms modules. You might be able to upgrade your modules, say from the version you've been using for a while, after whatever version includes Razor Pages, migrate those modules over to a Razor Pages paradigm. Now you're moving on, a, on something that then has a future pathway forward. So if we can move you from web forms to Razor Pages, DNN still behind the scenes, right? It's going to have that, that web forms pipeline. But the Razor Pages functionality that you built should then carry you into V10, V11, whatever we decide to call the .NET Core version, right? The timeline and everything else is still a little bit unsure because of the community contributions, how much we're going to be able to, how much assistance we're going to be able to get from ESW, any assistance we might be able to get from Microsoft, etc. Right? So I don't want to tell you, oh yeah, it's going to be coming in 10 months or 12 months or 18 months. We're working towards a pathway. But what we're trying to do is what guidance can we give the community to say, here's how you get there. Here's what you can do to at least make yourself more ready, right? I cannot guarantee any of you that if you get to Razor Pages, it's going to guaranteedly move forward. What I can guarantee you right now is your web form stuff will not work, right? That's the only thing, right? So it's, it's, it's a bit of a give and a take as we go forward. And the whole deal here <coughs> is I don't want to be leaving people behind, right? Anything that we can do to incrementally get you closer helps the community. I'm not a fan, and a lot of the community, there's actually a few that, that are against this, but a lot of us, we want to make sure that our existing modules can move forward, right? There's been some talk, if you heard any of the, the playback from the Q&A session at DNN Summit in February, there was some conversation of, well, we could just make it a completely breaking change. You have to rebuild your modules. That doesn't really work for a lot of the enterprise. In this room, out of curiosity, if we said, you know, the future version runs on .NET Core, everything that you wrote before doesn't work, would any of you say that that's okay? Man, there's three people in every room. Well, four. Um, so... And in, in the opposite, how many of you would, would leave the platform if we did that? How many of you would say, I'm done with DNN, I'm not going to handle that transition? If we said, everything you've written up to today is dead, you have to rewrite it. I feel that the people who would leave are not here. The, the, the people They've already gone? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I, I like already gone, or they're very, uh, they, they do it as a side project, they, they, it was easy and, and to, to maintain, but at the moment when we break it, they say, okay, it's too, too much to, to get figured out to, to restart. Okay. We had the same problem when, we, uh, when DNN uh, went from DNN 1 to DNN 2 and just had a, a reordering of uh, uh, namespaces at that time. And uh, it, it was clearly written, uh, documented process, but uh, the effect, unfortunately, was that uh, more than 50% of the developer left the, the, the boat. So, uh, of course, this is a high risk for coaching. 
Okay, no, that makes that makes total sense. And, and the reason I ask, right, is when we when we were talking with people about this at Dean Summit, right? There are the few people that said, "I don't care." That sounds like a good plan, right? There were a few people that said, "I'm just going to take my stuff and go home," right? The reality is, most of you, which I'm guessing the rest of you would agree with this, you're vested. You're going to have to do whatever we do, right? You have customers built that you created a solution in DNN with. You have an employer that's leveraged DNN, right? So in the end, you're going to do whatever we tell you. You may not be happy about it, right? And that's something we have to really keep in mind, right? Is we want to try to make it as easy as we can. And that's why I'm, I'm wanting to really continue these conversations and be able to find a way to you know, give everybody the tools to prepare to move forward. Okay? So with all of that, what options do we have? Right? I mean, what, what can you do today knowing that we don't have a clear pathway? Right? We do not have a roadmap. I don't have for you a timeline that says in three months we're going to have this new set of APIs. In six months we're going to have you know, this new data model. Right? I don't have that information for you today. So what can we do? Right? Our goal here is simple. I want to minimize the impact for you. How can we do something? How can we have you build solutions today that's going to have the best value for what you're doing today, still leveraging DNN and using it for the things that you want to use it for, but at the same time, managing your risk in the future, right? If you were to tell me today that you were going to spend $200,000 worth of development effort to build out a solution in DNN that was purely web forms and all of your stuff lived in DNN, I would caution you against that because we would be banking on something that we know is going to go away, right? So what we want to do is we want to try to figure out we still have to develop. The platform is still a good platform and it has a lot of benefits to it. So how do we bridge that gap? What do we do to compromise? And really what it breaks down to from my experience without getting too crazy is we have really three options. We can do nothing and just keep doing what we're doing, right? And just monitor. We can look at doing some migrations in our assemblies, restructuring our code a little bit to help get us a little bit closer. Or we can start to look at doing hybrid solutions, taking some of the stuff that we would traditionally have you know, forced into DNN and maybe move it out into an API or services layer that sits outside of DNN for a little while, right? Eventually maybe bringing it back in. So doing nothing, right? We really, it's pretty simple, right? We can continue building with web forms. We can still continue doing things with the MVC model. You don't have to do anything, right? There's no changes to your team. There's no changes to your process. The stuff that you know still works. You still know how to drop a rich text editor on a, on a form. You know how to deal with postbacks. You know how to do all of this. When talking with folks in the US, the biggest drawback that we've seen of doing absolutely nothing isn't even in the future technology. It's in the current technology in attracting and attaining developers. What we're finding, and I don't know if this is as true here in Europe, but finding a developer that willingly wants to go work in web forms all day is hard. Or to find a senior developer that has a lot of web forms experience is getting harder. Or they're commanding a higher salary because they have that unique experience. So we're finding that a lot of cases, the drawbacks are more on the personnel side, the training side, the compatibility side, right? We still have to deal with this fact that MVC doesn't do everything, right? I'm hoping that we're going to fix that gap sooner than later, right? But so doing nothing you can still do your business, right? Your sites are still going to be stable. You're still going to be able to leverage DNN 
But you're basically at this point banking that something magical is going to happen in the future or that the future change happens after your current software has outlived its useful life. Right? So one of the things that I've heard a lot with people in terms of staying the course and doing nothing different. If you're building a new solution for a customer that's a temporary thing, like let's just say you're building a, a, a one-off event website that needs to live for 12 months, build it however you can get it done quick. right? If it never needs to be retained, if it's not a recurring event. But if you're building a platform, if you're building a paradigm, I wouldn't stick right here just because eventually somebody's going to have to pay for it. Right? Somebody's going to have to make that transition. Another option that we have, and um, Daniel um, has talked about this with um, what he's done with some of his modules. Um, there's been blog posts about it. But basically, if we take our code and migrate as much of our code over to .NET standard as we can, we're going to build ourselves a buffer. Okay, So the goal here is to maybe break our modules into individual DLL components. Okay, Our goal being to extract as much of our code as we can into a DLL that meets .NET standard requirements. Okay, A DLL that meets .NET standard requirements is going to allow you to have code that has no dependency on system.web. What happens when you do this is that component in the future should then be able to move into the new DNN that runs on .NET Core. By adhering to the .NET standard implementation, you will be able to essentially guarantee that that code will run on .NET Core. Now, what does that mean for you, right? What it means is you can still leverage everything in DNN. You're just doing it in a slightly different manner, right? Instead of a click event on your page in a web form that has a bunch of code in the code behind, you may take the user supplied information, push that user supplied information into an object and then pass it down into that business layer. Right? It gets you some reusability, gets you a little bit of portability. Um, but the good news is it's going to give us a bulk bit of reusability. The things you have to avoid right, are interactions with data grids, interactions with any of those web controls. Because again, we're needing to stay away from system.web because that's the big piece that we don't have. Okay. The nice thing is, you know, it's, it's not a huge change. How much gain this gets you in the future, again, I can't tell you exactly. But what I can say is, it sure beats having stuff architected in a way that we don't meet this standard. Now, the drawbacks, it's not going to fix talent acquisition issues, right? It's not going to fix... The fact that somebody doesn't want to work in web forms because you're still working in web forms or, or whatever the case may be. Um, it can get clunky because sometimes the way you're doing things, you still need that, that reference to system.web. So some of the stuff that really should live inside of that reusable library may not be able to live there. Um, it's not the end of the world, right? but it's something that, that could impact you. Right, over time. With all of that, you know, we also don't take care of any of the other things, right? I mean, we, we get people a lot of times too. I like the MVC model over web forms because I can do more UI, UX experience things more easily, or they prefer the SPA module um, development paradigm, whatever the case may be. So it's not a perfect solution, but what we're banking on here, right, is get as big of a chunk of my stuff as I can into an assembly that I know can roll forward. Right? That at least gets us part of the way there. Now, what we've been doing as an organization is tackling things from a slightly different manner. Doesn't work for all situations, 
but it works well when we have certain project uh, structures. So a hybrid approach is something where we basically leverage both DNN and .NET Core. Okay? So my goal here is to identify situations you know, that might allow us to just use .NET Core to do all of the .NET Core things and use .NET Nuke to do the .NET Nuke things. It only works in scenarios where we can do a nice separation of those responsibilities. You know, this is not something that's been documented. It really is a project by project basis. But I want to just kind of share that thought process of, of a way of mitigating some of the things. So what we've done is we take a project that has maybe a big data requirement, a big back-end small user base scenario. I wouldn't do this with somebody with public registration, most likely. I wouldn't do this with somebody that has a lot of crazy, um, crazy deep integrations within DNN. But a situation where you have a project that has maybe a complex database of products, a complex listing of users, locations, and things like that, where the information is managed by a small set of administrators, and then that information needs to be displayed in DNN or interacted with in DNN in some capacity, but then they still need all of the content management solutions that DNN offers. Right? They need the ability to add a blog. They need the ability to do dynamic page creation. This gives me a great way to separate some things architecturally. Store all of the administration stuff in a .NET Core project. Offer up APIs from that. Consume those APIs inside of DNN. So then your DNN module can be a simple MVC module that makes an API call, gets your data back, and does all of the UI. Right? So now what we've done is we've reduced the footprint, again, of what we're leveraging inside of DNN. Now, in this scenario, right, in the future, if we get full .NET Core support for DNN, you could probably slide those two projects back together. No longer do the API call. It would just become a reference, that kind of thing. So the benefits here is you can fully embrace .NET Core. So what we're doing here is we, are, we will use a subdomain to allow these people to get to that .NET Core app. You know, admin dot, whatever the, the website may be. They log in. We built a custom authentication provider that allows them to log into DNN with the same username so that we don't have to worry about it. So we can integrate them tightly and quickly. From there, we can really work on a .NET Core project and a DNN project. So from a talent acquisition perspective, right, we actually get a lot of benefit because we're doing .NET Core and we're doing it the full way. We're doing it with you know, Razor and all of the templates and the rules and the controllers. Everything that you want to do on .NET Core is there. The difference is we're adding an extra layer. right? We extend a service API. But this allows us to let a developer focus on doing all of the .NET Core stuff. Right? In our scenario, we have full automated builds, automated deploys, both to staging and production, in those environments because we have easy support for it. The DNN deployment, we are actually able to even automate that as well by packaging up the modules and deploying them, since it's all configuration-based and, and module instance-based. So, Thinking a little bit outside the box, we're able to, to do some stuff which, again, may benefit us. Um, the drawback, more than anything, is you're architecting a very complex solution on your own. You are maintaining two web properties. So people that are incredibly cost conscious, we are talking about you know, an extra SSL cert per year. Or you had to buy a wildcard cert instead of buying you know, a single domain. Not a lot of money, but seriously, we, we run into situations, right, where it's a consideration. Um, patching, um, you know, for security releases and things like that, right, you also need to keep that in consideration. We have to keep DNN patched, and we have to keep .NET Core patched. You know, but all in all, 
we've seen some pretty good examples with it. Um, I'm not going to try to actually go out and, and bring up the website today, um, but we've actually done this with um, MuleHideProducts.com. Um, this website, it's a DNN 9.2 installation. At least I'm pretty sure it's 9.2. If not, it's 9.1.1. Um, this installation has a combination of regular out-of-the-box DNN CMS functionality. It's home page, all DNN the way you would normally expect it to be. Everything underneath the about section, everything about the contact us section, the news and events, all DNN out of the box or DNN third party modules. Okay? The roofing products section. This is consuming those APIs that we created from the back end. They have a, a really complex product database that has over 93 attributes associated with each product and some crazy category mappings um, and some other stuff. All of that information is provided as a service out of the .NET Core app. Up at the top navigation menu there, there's a, a find a rep. That drives a Google Maps implementation that does custom searching and driving directions um, to find nearest locations. Um, that information is also entirely served from the .NET Core system. So when they want to come in and change regular content, they do so in DNN. Everything else around their assets, their business, they change in the .NET Core app. Architecturally, it looks something like this. The public site users go to DNN. DNN goes into the database. When DNN needs something from the .NET Core app, it first checks the DNN cache because, again, performance is key, right? I want to make sure we don't do anything there. So it looks in the cache if it's not there. It goes over to the .NET Core app, which has its own database. This is where that infrastructure change happens. In this scenario, my opinion and belief is that this other data needs to live in its own database. I don't want to risk intermingling a full .NET Core app and DNN because I want to be able to do migrations I want to be able to do all of the things that, that come with Entity Framework and that kind of thing. So we're breaking away from the DNN model of data access, but I've never really needed DNN's data access model. What I've needed is I needed the APIs, right? And this is where project by project, right, it's going to depend on what you're trying to accomplish. What we've seen with this project and, and a number of other projects of similar nature for these folks, we have over 15 gigabytes of documents and images that due to the .NET Core implementation and what we did with it, those documents are all stored in Azure CDN. They're separated from DNN. They're even separated from the .NET Core app. This keeps their DNN footprint at just a hair over 245 megabytes, which is not much more than DNN's default um, in terms of all files. Their .NET Core app is 41 megabytes, which is exactly the default configuration plus a couple style sheets and images. Um, all of this information is then able to be consumed in other places. They're building a mobile app for a different purpose. The data that exists in the .NET Core app is providing that find a retailer location information to the mobile app as well as DNN. So it serves as a central hub. Um, we haven't had, you know, administrators still use DNN the same way. The only difference is, is when they go and work on one, you know, the product data, they have to go elsewhere. To make it easy, we added a product management link inside of DNN that redirects them automatically to the .NET Core app. And from the .NET Core app, we have a website administration link that directs them to DNN. So from a user's experience, they're seeing the URL change, they're seeing some UI and UX changes between the .NET Core app and otherwise, but we're able to give them the best-in-class experience in .NET Core. We're also able to give them the best-in-class experience with the CMS. And more importantly, worst-case scenario, we could take their public-facing website and move it to WordPress with less than 50 hours worth of work because I'd had to build two custom plugins, 
a product catalog plugin, and a find a rep plugin. So the win here is we're agnostic in development paradigm and we're really future proof with DNN or whatever else they would decide to do as a CMS. Okay? It's definitely outside the box, does not work for everybody. But as we start talking with people, you know, what have they been doing? How have they been solving it? What are their concerns? This was a great way to be able to invest heavily, still leverage and lean on DNN for a lot of the critical components, but also not run a risk that the entire backend infrastructure was built on DAL2, and then we decide that we're not going to support Petapoco anymore. Right? So definitely a lot of give and take on both sides. Um, but right now, these are the three at the highest level best ways to look at how do you go to .NET Core today? Or how do you prepare to go to .NET Core soon? Questions, thoughts, areas that you guys have looked at? Yeah. Do you have any idea about how other products do the migration, like no commerce, for example, or what does Microsoft recommend for such migrations? Do they also recommend hybrid or full migration? Or so in, right now, from a, a migration from web forms to um, .NET Core from Microsoft, the official recommendation is there is no migration plan. It is a rewrite. That, that is the official answer from Microsoft in relation to how you transition. There was a glimmer of hope in February when I was at the MVP summit and I sat down with Scott Hunter real quick. Um, there was a discussion of this thing that they were calling the, the Web Forms Shim, which was going to be a, essentially a bridge DLL that would give you system.web in .NET Core. They have determined that the level of development effort for the game was not worth it, and there is no plan for them to implement. So Mitch, why, so why uh, do we think uh, that's not the correct way to tackle that? And why uh, should they do it otherwise then? The, in the end, right, our dependencies on web forms, although intertwined greatly, is also fairly minimal when you look at the total scope of the, of the project. Right? Peter mentioned um, in the opening remarks yesterday, right, 200 and, what was it, 230,000 lines? 244,000 lines of code in the .NET group of DLL. Okay. So in that DLL, there is less than 5% of that DLL that's actually dependent upon system.web. That's, the, the problem is, that, that's exactly what we're trying to do. The problem is, is that that 5% is literally the entire way DNN works. So um, it's kind of, you know, it's like digging the foundation out of underneath your house. Um, you know, it's a small piece of the total cost of your house, but the house crumbles if you remove it. You know, a big sinkhole opens up underneath your house, you've got problems. So hence, hence Microsoft concluding, well, it's, it's not worth it, so uh, there's no migration plan. So again, why do we think, well, there is a, we should, we should have a migration plan? Um, oh, but wait, it, there's, there's several migration plans, of course. There's eight, I think, in part, we need to distinguish between the migration of your data, which I think for most end users is absolutely vital, and there's the migration of your code, your modules, your stuff that you build on top of that, which concerns us as developers. Right? And so you can, don't, don't confuse the two. I mean, there is there's definitely, of course, uh, uh, you have to have also an effort to preserve it first, to not lose everything that's been yeah, and I think the I think the biggest thing is you know the the Microsoft stance right that there isn't a migration path. Um, it, it's it's a more absolute way of looking at things, because in all reality, if you've ever moved a Web Forms project to MVC, there's not a migration path, but there's a lot of reusability, with proper architecture, right, and moving things out into you know individual class files into individual libraries, you get a lot of reusability. So 
as, as much as the, the absolute is there is no migration path, the reality is we can do some of that transition and still gain the features. Because the main reason, right, we wouldn't want to just say throw out DNN and start with something new is we have a lot of features that would have to be entirely re-implemented. Right? A lot of the back-end stuff of how DNN works, the database structures to store pages and content and modules, the dynamic loading of modules, the di dynamic uh, rendering of things, all of those components are still usable in .NET Core. The problem is, is the pipeline that they're plugged into is what's not. So it's identifying that scope and, and figuring out how to fix that. It is possible, right? The, the final answer is it's not worth the effort and that we do need to start over. But what we need to do is continue down the pathway of identifying what we have, what works, what doesn't work, what can go forward, what can't go forward, and then reducing the size of the framework as well. You know, with the 9.2 release, there were a lot of, you know, old code that for years, you know, they had said, we're deleting this. Well, they finally did, and we all know how well that worked out. But it goes towards the scenario of being able to shrink the footprint. If we can get the footprint as small as we can, then we can evaluate what can we do to bring that footprint all the way forward. So it is definitely an iterative process, and we are still making an assumption that we'll be able to do the transition. Others have made the transition. They've done it in various ways. Other CMSs have made the transition, but they've all done it in a different way. Some have scrapped and rewrote, and then they start with a much smaller feature set. Others have found a way to do a side-by-side -side deploy. Um, and, and leverage things that way. So I, it, it is definitely still something, you know, it, it's, if you feel strongly one way or the other or have some experience with it, you know, the, the community is, is driving this direction now. So get with us with the technology advisory group, share your opinion. We're, you know, what we're trying to do is we're trying to do whatever is going to make the best long-term success for DNN and for everybody in the community. I understand you're doing that because you want to keep the full purpose of that core. Now, if we say we want to stay in the context of IIS, is that possible to do it in a simple web app where it would be seen as a directory instead of being seen as a different domain? Um, yes. You, there would be no reason that you could not run a .NET Core app as a app instead of a subdirectory. Um, my only reason why I don't do it is you run into some really unique things with config file overrides and the DNN URL rewriting. Sometimes it'll grab a URL fragment of one of those subdirectories. Um, I found that the relative gain of simplicity with one domain name versus the risk of things completely stopping working on a regular basis made it not worth it, but it is technically possible. I thought the application pool would be non-managed in, in that case. Application pool is non-managed. I've still seen, it all depends on how the matching happens in IIS, right? In theory, you put them in two separate pools, one pool with non-managed, you shouldn't have it, I've still seen things where IIS doesn't follow the rules. Um, it, it, it's rare, but you know, it, some people do it with great success. I typically get the phone calls when it fails, so I don't see the success. Um, is is what I usually end up seeing. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, and you could definitely continue that. 
Right. I mean, that's the biggest thing is you get the web config overrides even if you have non-managed code running. I mean, the nice thing is .NET Core doesn't use a web.config. The problem is, is IIS does. So that's where you get the real weird things, right? Because if you have HTTP modules in your web config, and then that cascades down, but then you're not running in a managed pool, there, there's just a lot of config stuff. Usually once you get it done, and you've documented how it was done, it stays stable. It's just that time to document and, and get there. And I could imagine that maybe you run some cookie problems because then both applications share the same domain. If you're using the same cookie names, that would also be, yeah, if you, .NET Core apps should use a, there, there shouldn't be any cookie name similarities, at least out of the box, but that would be another thing to definitely monitor. Yes. So, you know, there's been there's been talk of, you know, supporting a MVC pipeline only version and a web forms only version, right? Basically move the platform forward, but let what we have today limp along as a, a maintained legacy product. Um, I don't think we have the community size to maintain two platforms. I, I just I being realistic. We have an amazing community of very passionate and educated developers, but I do not believe that we have under the open source umbrella of volunteer time commitment, I don't think that we can support that. Um, Kentico CMS. No, no, not for a long time, but for a transition period of a year. Yes, it's definitely move one into a maintenance mode. I, I believe personally, no matter what we do, we're going to have to commit to a maintenance mode of the current architecture for some period of time. The technology group so far has thrown out two years as that time period, where whatever we say, this is the last major feature release, and then what happens is it's small bug fixes, security fixes, .NET framework updates if necessary to move it forward. That I believe is full, you know, fully feasible. Um, it's just not active development over time. All right, I'll go to the up here front. Oh, all right. Um, the, the example that you showed before mm -hmm. goes into a direction, from my point of view, that you have an admin area, mm -hmm. actually a front end area. Yes. So, have you ever thought about uh, splitting this up into a, like a back office area in the end and the, and the front end part? Because it goes into that direction. I, know it, that, I think there are a lot of uh, DNN, sorry, uh, there are a lot of um, uh, content management which uh, do it. And in my opinion, and from my experience with DNN and, and c c communication with clients, <coughs> that they really like it to be able to click the edit button on the page. And I think this is one of the key features we have in DNN. We, sh we shouldn't try to, to now to go the path of having a dedicated backup because there are already lots of. CMS which have it and people you know, who prefer this should go that, uh, should uh, take that uh, idea. I think for us it would be a complete paradigm uh, switch which takes a lot of effort and doesn't really uh, mean any benefit for our time. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's one of those things where it depends on what you're doing. Um, in, in our case with, with our clients, um, they like the fact that when they're managing their niche specific product information, there's no DNN. The public facing website doesn't exist. We actually use an, an admin styled theme back there as well. So we don't have a company logo and a big massive footer at the bottom. It's a very thin navigation header, uh, or navigation header right, that says you know, blah, 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 back end. Um, we give them a flag for you know, production or staging environment. And then uh, a simple left-hand side menu. So they love it from that perspective. I personally would love if we could take DNN's content management and move it that way. But I believe Sebastian's point is 100% is valid. That's an entire paradigm shift of, of how DNN works. And there's some visual aspects of it where 
I know how our sites are built. You know, so for example, I could administer a I could administer a DNN site by seeing a list of content and realizing that oh, this is in the content pane, and I totally would get where it goes. But I use only custom skins that have only containers for what I want them to have. Um, people that are using the containers that they buy from the store that have you know 97 uh, a skin with 97 containers. I don't know what row underscore 15 blah 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 blah. I don't know where that goes. So there's some definite you know I I think it's an interesting thought process of could we move because I do think certain things need to be centralized into an admin area. The persona bar I think helps. You know, I think the persona bar really shows a lot of it being good. I think there's more things that should be moved into the persona bar, um, personally. And actually, but, the persona bar is also technically made with an iframe, so that would maybe also be an option. Mm -hmm. Yep. Get them. I think everything you move to, to, to uh, uh, as a technology like, uh, like JavaScript uh, framework or anything written in React it will be easy to transition. Um, compared, of course, anything you write it down to your web page. Yes, and I think there's the, the one thing too, right? We, we have one major persona bar problem that is being reported right now that, actually, how many of you try to edit a DNN site or ever have a need to edit a DNN site from a mobile device or a tablet? So, as much as the persona bar is amazing, you can't edit a DNN site at all from a mobile device anymore. Something we've been able to do since DNN 2. And I've had to do that. Right? I've been traveling, I've been at the airport, I've had a client do something stupid, and I've needed to log in and go look at the event viewer, edit a page, delete a module, add a module, do that kind of stuff from a phone. And we cannot do that today. So. As we go and do all of this technology evolution and evaluation, we also have to make sure we don't lose a feature. And it's all intertwined together, right? Going to .NET Core, we need to keep our feature set, but we need to also not, you know, hinder ourselves going forward. I, I, I do not completely agree because things like bannering was sometimes in, in the system. Sales uh, versions were in the beginning. So I think. Uh, moving the deprecated uh, routines and deleting them from the core was excellent, although it created a lot of work. Communication should have been better, right? I think it should have been totally no, deleted. I, 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 really, I really like the fact that there has been a decision to run things out. Yeah. It lowered the footprint a yeah. lot. It forced people to really rethink what they've been doing. But maybe there are possibilities to scrap even more out of GNN. To make the footprint and the and that are left over there that should be moved over small and small. That is hands down what the technology group is looking at right now. Right? Simplify and make the APIs as tight as possible because then we have the smallest footprint to migrate. And that's where I think the expectation here, and, and the reason why I try to encourage find a way to build today that's going to make you more future proof. What we want to do is we want to get it to be as good as it can be right now and as tight as it can be right now and then move forward. Right? We have a large number of bugs in the persona bar. We have a large number of bugs in other areas. If we take a buggy thing and then migrate it to a new platform, now we have an extra buggy, buggy thing that <laughs> nobody knows. Did we break it when we migrated it? Or was it just always broken and nobody fixed it? Well, it's gone. And, and we also document it, right? I mean, a simple release note that says, when we, this release removed these APIs, right, and list every yeah. single one of them. The other thing is we need consistency in our APIs. Right, right now we still have like 40% of the APIs you access via a static, and then you have the other ones that you need an instance to, 
and sometimes you need it from the dot instance, and, but sometimes it's dot instance that's a property, other times it's dot instance that's a method. That level of consistency, right? If we can have consistent code, then we can move it forward. And that's where as the technology group looks at things, um, it, it's not been a popular opinion, but I want to clean we support it. You. We support you. Right? I want to yeah. clean it before we move it. But yeah, I know Tom